Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. 2007 is the 400th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown, the first permanent English settlement in North America. With me to talk about that historic event is Dr. Dave Krieger, former professor of history here at the college. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Barry. I guess we should start off by saying that perhaps permanent settlement is a misnomer because it's a national park today. <laughs> that indeed is true. Uh, uh, the the uh, original settlers, all 144 of them, picked what in the uh, what, what they should have seen as an unsustainable and horrendous place to locate a settlement. But I think that's the way the English do things. They muddle through. And initially these were Englishmen. They did settle on an island in the middle of the swamp on the James River and so contacted all kinds of horrendous diseases. They had to contend with deer flies, which are still a terrible problem along the James River where the settlement was located. And uh, uh, it was not, a, not, a very, not an ideal site, but they believed it would help uh, provide defense against the Spanish, who they felt might be lurking out there somewhere, and most certainly against those uh, terrible Algonquin Indians, at least as they viewed the Native Americans. So Jamestown is what, about 60 miles from the open ocean? And yeah, I think maybe a little less, but roughly about that. Uh, the, uh, the settlement was established, quite bluntly, by a private company named the Virginia Company, uh, which is where Virginia gets its name. Virginia. Uh, takes its name from Queen Elizabeth I, who was fondly known as the Virgin Queen. You don't have to believe that, but uh, well, uh, because she Sir never Walter married. Raleigh perhaps uh, could comment on that. James, yeah, good. Jamestown uh, was named for the uh, King of England in 1607, James I. So this was all they were getting their 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 political uh, dominoes in line, you might mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. uh, they established it there. The colony and the company that established the colony was was aiming to make money. That was their objective. That's it was a corporation. It was a corporation uh, called a joint stock company at the mm -hmm. time, but they hoped to make money by finding gold. And of course, as we know, there isn't any gold of value in Virginia. Right. They were going to find the Northwest Passage, the all-water route to Asia, and uh, where they settled on the James River seemed to be the place because there was still plenty of salt in the water. And they believed also that uh, they would be able to find silkworms and make silk because Virginia lay roughly in the latitudes of China. None of that, of course, would pan out. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the National Park, the, uh, <clears throat> it's basically just the settlement site. Yes. That uh, they've done a lot of excavations there. But, uh, you know, again, it, it always strikes me, we call it the first permanent settlement, but yet there's nothing there but a National Park. Uh, uh, what was the impulse during that period for the English to, to go out and do this? These 105 intrepid souls who did this, what was the impulse from England itself? From England itself, um, um, there were a number of reasons. Uh, one reason, I think, was to, to, to try to provide uh, uh, a base from which to further harass the Spanish who were uh, in the incredible, what were considered the incredibly rich Caribbean islands uh, and in Mexico, uh, and the, the Spanish and the English were, were mortal enemies at the time. Another reason, I think, is that uh, the English merchant class had excess profits to invest and risk. They'd made enormous amounts of money in the wool trade uh, and probably also in the wine trade with Portugal. This money was available to invest. And traditionally, it's also said that there was a large class of unemployed Englishmen, ruffians as they were called, uh, raising the crime rate, it was thought, in the country, and a place was needed to dump those people. America might be the place. Mm -hmm. so, so there were these, these, these reasons that caused the English to, to uh, by the early, uh, oh really by the late uh, 16th century, to take a more serious interest in North America. Actually, English fishermen had been off the uh, coast of New England fishing uh, in, the, in the 16th century and had brought smallpox to the, Eng the, the Native Americans there and pretty much well decimated the population. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the coast of North America was not new to Englishmen. Well, in fact, of course, the, the Roanoke settlement, the famous lost colony, right. uh, that came a cropper. Uh, and that, that too is a national park in Roanoke. It's North Carolina, I think. People think Roanoke, Virginia, but that's but it's a, not. all right. the other different places. It's an island off the coast of North Carolina. Right. It's part of the Outer Banks. Right. Uh, and that, that, was a, that was a failure. Uh, and it was a private venture. So James basically said, 
go ahead and do this, but you have my blessing, but not my money. That is correct. The crown uh, was not willing to risk much of its own money. The English government in the early 17th century was not as, as cash uh, rich as, as some of the other monarchies in Europe mm -hmm. at the time. And, and so was willing to, to give the endeavor over to private companies. And most all of the, the American colonies were established as private ventures. Uh, later, after uh, uh, a period of time in, in Virginia, relatively quickly, uh, the government would, uh, uh, would basically take over the private country, uh, per private uh, company, and uh, make uh, Vir Virginia a royal colony under the control of the mm -hmm. English crown. When the settlers arrived in, in Jamestown, it was May. Yes. Beautiful spring weather. Uh, much pl more pleasant than English spring, which is quite wet and disagreeable and cold. And, and then as time goes on, th their thoughts on Virginia began to change when they get into that hot, sapping, humid summer and these diseases. Uh, so I think these fellows go from being, thinking they're the luckiest 105 fellows on earth, and most of them died that first year, did they not? That is true. I think only about 37 or 38 of the original 140 or whatever it was survived that first winter. Uh, part of the problem is that uh, neither the settlers nor the company realized that some planning needed to go into establishing a beachhead in North America. Um, they were all men. Mm -hmm. They were near do wells, which is to put it, they were men who were on the make for making their fortunes, but never quite succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some tradesmen. Uh, there were sons, uh, younger sons of the nobility who were disinherited. Uh, there were some convicts. And uh, none of them believed that it uh, was their responsibility to plant crops and raise food. They went out to dig for, for gold. Uh, they searched for silkworms, which they did not find. Um, they believed food or corn, which is what it was, was to be had for the taking from the Indians, uh, which indeed they did, did when the Indians wouldn't trade corn. They took it, causing Indian reprisals. Mm -hmm. And so they encountered numerous difficulties. Mm -hmm. Now again, this is supposed to be a profit-making venture. They finally discover what they call brown gold. Brown gold, also known as tobacco. Uh, uh, a character by the name of John Rolfe, who was one of the early colonists, experimented uh, with some West Indian tobacco and it grew well. And I think by 1617, the, the uh, Jamestown settlement had sold some 60,000 pounds of tobacco in London and made enormous profits. At that point, these men who believed that farming was beneath their dignity uh, rushed to establish uh, to plant themselves in plantations along the James River and raise tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, here was a cash crop. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are stories that they planted it in cemeteries, they planted it in yards, I mean, everywhere. And they actually, you, didn't they use tobacco as money? Yes, it? tobacco was a form of money because money was not uh, uh, in circulation in, in Jamestown at the time. And so you could pay in, in tobacco, you could pay uh, uh, ministers in tobacco and they became unhappy with the way uh, their reimbursement which led to uh, uh, difficulties later on. Mm -hmm. Now of course John Rolfe is the husband of Pocahontas Correct. And, and not Captain John Smith. How did that story get started with Captain John Smith? Uh, did he make it up? Some say he did. Um, John Smith is an interesting character uh, who who uh, was a part of the original uh, band of, of settlers in Jamestown. He wrote a history of Virginia and also included in that history, history of New England as well. And he was captured, indeed, he was captured by uh, the, the native Indians. They were Algonquins. Their chief was Powhatan, who, who ran a large Indian confederacy. And when Powhatan wanted to uh, assert his dominance over uh, a neighboring tribe, he usually attached one of his children, a son or a daughter, to that tribe. Well, John Smith is captured. He's brought into Powhatan's village. Uh, his, he is, his head is put down on the rock. There's indications that he's going to be clubbed to death, at which point Powhatan's 13-year-old daughter, Pocahontas, rushes in according to John Smith, and saved him from certain execution, pleading with her father to spare him. And spare him he did. Mm -hmm. That's John Smith's take on it. 
the reality is it was probably a ritual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a ritual in which Powhatan was establishing his dominance over this tribe of Englishmen at Jamestown. And uh, uh, the daughter or son that was selected to live with the tribe that was, was to come under Powhatan's dominance uh, would, would run in and save this person from execution, uh, making, making the, the, the person about to be executed, supposedly, subservient uh, to uh, the Algonquin chief. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, what you got going on there is uh, two groups of people talking right past each other at different levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Powhatan and the Indians conducting this as a, as a ritual to make the English subservient to them. John Smith seeing this the act of a brave uh, a young woman or girl uh, who is saving his life. Mm -hmm. Both sides did not understand what the other side was thinking. Mm -hmm. And of course Pocahontas and Captain John Smith becomes this legend, this wonderful love story and as a matter of fact, if it was true, I guess John Smith would have been a child molester, wouldn't he? Well, I mean, probably so, because <laughs> she was 13, but there again, uh, marriages occurred at, at younger sure. ages and, and views of those kinds of activities. But, but that is such a persistent legend in American history. In fact, the, the Walt Disney movie with right. Pocahontas. Oh, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but the love interest was, was John Rolfe and Pocahontas. And the story has a very tragic ending, does it not? Yes, Pocahontas. it does. Uh, Pocahontas in 1613 was captured by a raiding party from Jamestown. Pocahontas, after her capture, then married John Rolfe, one of these settlers in Jamestown. Um, and Pocahontas thought that perhaps what was happening is that she and the Algonquins were now becoming subservient to the English and that that was the function of the marriage. Uh, John uh, Rolfe then took Pocahontas to England, uh, where she lived until her death uh, about four years later. Uh, she. Uh, was the mother of a son by John Rolfe named Thomas. And mm -hmm. after, after her death, he did return to Virginia, and there probably are still descendants mm -hmm. of, of her son, um, Thomas, uh, in Virginia and elsewhere in this country. And then, of course, John was killed in, the, in a, an Indian raid later. That is summer. correct. Yeah. And when she was in England, she was considered very exotic. Was it well, yes, she Indian was considered ex and exotic, an Indian princess, and of course she would be viewed that way. Um, probably much in the same way that the Indians that uh, Columbus much earlier had brought back from the, from the Caribbean islands to Spain. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Might also add that the English were quite arrogant in terms of their attitude towards the, the native tribes. Uh, they made no effort to learn the English language, to learn, learn the Algonquin language. John Smith made, was an exception, he tried. So, and I suppose you could say that right from the beginning, these English were determined that everybody should speak English, uh, even though they were the new arrivals at the time. Mm -hmm. There's a theory in history that the English treatment of Native Americans is based on their treatment of the Irish. Do you buy that? I, I, I don't think so. That, that, uh, just so the viewers understand, uh, uh, probably 15, 20 years ago, the view came that the English learned how to deal with Native Americans by the way in which they dealt with the Irish when they invaded Ireland uh, and, and in dealing with them in an extremely brutal way. I don't believe, that's, believe that is necessarily true. The relationship initially that occurred between the Jamestown settlers and the English was a uh, relationship of mutual convenience. Mm -hmm. The English who refused to farm needed the corn from the Indians to survive. The Indians, on the other hand, were awed by the guns and reluctant to launch a direct attack on the English. They also wanted the English trade goods, metal goods, which they could then use to trade with other tribes and show their importance and, and, and their power over these other tribes. So there was this mutual convenience. Mm -hmm. It came to an end in the 1620s, when in the 1620s the, the English tended to, to regard the the uh, natives as utter savages. And I don't mean utter savages simply in terms of the way in which warfare was conducted, but they were savages because they didn't dress right. They weren't Christian. Women worked in the fields. Therefore, men, it was assumed, were lazy. Uh, uh, the English were terribly ethnocentric and, and saw the world only in terms of their own limited English experience, a usual way in which people view uh, strange uh, strangers or people in other societies. Mm -hmm. Going back to John Smith's book, he writes in graphic detail of the starving time 
when, when I, you reap what you sow, and they didn't sow much, and they yeah. didn't reap much. And so talk about the starving time. The starving time was the winter of 1609-1610. And in the fall of 1609, there were perhaps around 500 uh, uh, individuals in Jamestown. Uh, it, they, 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 they didn't know how to hunt. They scared off the game when they attempted to go out there. They hadn't planted any crops. They had not been particularly successful in extracting corn uh, from the Indians, probably because the Indians needed the corn to survive the winter themselves. And so as the winter of 1609 progressed and we move on into January and February of 1610, they ran out of food. They ate the dogs that they had brought with them, the horses, the few that were there. They even ate the rats. And the thing I find amazing is they ran out of rats. I did not realize that human beings were effective rat catchers, but I, apparently they are. A few of them even then began to consume human bodies. Uh, he writes about yes, that. Yes, he writes about a man who was in the process of eating his wife, and John, uh, John Smith was astounded. Well, to deal with that situation, they then executed the man who was devouring his wife, which of course meant there was one less mouth to feed. Um, Good point. And by the end of that winter, out of the 500 who were there, uh, only 60 survived. And uh, the story has it that when the provision ships arrived, this in the spring of 1610, and someone said, we, you can all go back to England, there was much cheering and shouting. Quite frankly, the colony survived only because it was kept be, being replenished year after year with other Englishmen. Right, right. And that's a wonderful story as yeah. they're sailing out yeah. and they see the relief ships and they come back and, and, yeah. and they succeed. So without tobacco, this would have been a financial disaster. The, the, it, would not have, it would not have succeeded. Jamestown is called a permanent settlement, even though, as you point out, no one lives there today. No one has lived there for probably about 300 years. Mm -hmm. It's called permanent because it marked a beachhead. The Englishmen did not mm -hmm. pick up and go back. Mm -hmm. But instead from Jamestown, Englishmen uh, began to move up the rivers, establishing plantations. English settlement, the English were there to stay, mm -hmm. and stay they would. 1619 is a fateful year in the history of that colony. Um, it's been described as, as the roots of, of American slavery and American freedom. I mean, uh, talk about that. Um, 1619, uh, tobacco is being grown. The problem with tobacco is that it is labor intensive. You need a lot of hands to produce the crop. But by 1619, Virginia has the reputation of being a good place to go if you want to die, uh, especially an meet your maker at an early age. It was a pest house. Mm -hmm. The company had to attract labor. One of the ways in which the Virginia Company attracted labor was to go into the real estate business because one thing it had to give away in enormous quantity was land. Of course, the Native Americans weren't consulted about this, but uh, there was enormous amounts of land to be given away. And so what the company did was to establish a, a system by which it would give land to people who would come to Virginia and establish plantations. People who could not afford the passage across the Atlantic could basically mortgage their labor or their bodies and become temporary slaves. Indentured servants. They're right. called indentured servants mm -hmm. for three or four years. Mm -hmm. And they would come and work the plantations. Um, the uh, company also established a legislature for the colony, the first legislature in North America. Now the first, first time it met, it met for five days and they decided it was too darn hot to do any work <laughs> and they, they all went back home. It used but the legislature was summer. established. I they also introduced English common law and the English procedure, English legal system, and that became the legal system for America. All that was important because Virginia was the first colony, and the notion of private ownership of property, of real estate, became ingrained in all the other colonies. So slavery, slavery was not introduced in 1619, but the first uh, Africans mm -hmm. arrived in the colony. They probably became indentured servants. We're not really sure about what happened to mm -hmm. them. Slavery really was more of a, an 18th century phenomenon in, in the South, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it marked the arrival of, of Africans. And, the, and I guess that's what I mean. The House of Burgesses is considered, I guess, the birth of representative government, all that was certainly not perfect. And you can see in the arrival of these Africans the roots of slavery. And I think that's the, the real irony of that date, I guess. Yeah, and, the, and, and in a sense, the roots of slavery may rest with indentured servitude, the use of poor, unemployed Englishmen 
to work in the plantation fields because their, their term of service was constantly lengthened, much to their dismay. Mm -hmm. And this wonderful House of Burgesses, this first legislature uh, in the 1620s decreed that regardless of your, the contract, your work contract, you would work as a, on, your, on your master's plantation until you were 24 years old. And so that lengthened the term of service. Mm -hmm. um, How did Bacon's Rebellion uh, plan Okay, this? Bacon's Rebellion, and again, I, the, the audience probably isn't familiar with this, was a rebellion which occurred in 1696 in which uh, 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 poor planters, basically descendants of indentured servants in, in the frontier regions, rose up in a revolt against the established aristocracy and the government in the East. They wanted, the, the reasons for the revolt are not particularly edifying. They wanted more lands, they wanted to exterminate the Indians, and they wanted better representation. Um, the revolt failed, but what it did do was convince the established elite that it was unwise to bring poor Englishmen over mm -hmm. because they might indeed revolt again and overturn the aristocracy. So, isn't and that so increasingly they turned to, to Africans right. and to permanent, and Africans as permanent slaves to work the plantations. So that is considered by many historians as a stimulus to starting the slavery. Right, that indeed was a, a stimulant for starting slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Virginia begins to expand uh, out of Jamestown. Williamsburg becomes the capital. It ultimately. becomes the capital. But Virginia was a rural society. Virginia expanded along the rivers. Plantations mm -hmm. are located on the rivers. If you ever go to Virginia, you go, you go to Mount Vernon, perhaps the most famous of these plantations. Mm -hmm. It's right on the Potomac River. Uh, and that's so ocean-going ships could sail directly to George right. Washington's plantation and, and load the tobacco. Um, it was also a very wasteful form of agriculture because tobacco exhausts the land. And these, the, these planters believe that if there's one thing that existed in inexhaustible quantity, it was, was fertile soil. And so, so they wasted the land and constantly kept moving inland in search of more, more fertile soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, <coughs> in the long run, Virginia is instructive and it's instructive in ways that some Americans would find disagreeable to today. It's instructive because the primary objective of this colony and of those individuals was to make money. Uh, they did not come to establish a religious haven. Uh, this was a primarily a secular society. Religion was relatively unimportant. Uh, Anglican ministers, and the, and the primary church was the Church of England in that area, uh, were far and few between. Um, this was a society which was based on, uh, very, very much on intolerance towards other kinds of people. Initially the Native Americans and then quite obviously later on Africans. This was a society that believed very much in a class structure. And as time went on, these, these, these uh, settlers tried to model, model themselves after the English, having a privileged and wealthy aristocracy and the others beneath them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, they did introduce English law, and that was the, became the basis of the American legal system. Trial by jury, for example. There are some people who believe that the basis of American law, of course, is, is the Bible and especially the Ten Commandments. But you do not find the jury system in the Bible or the Ten Commandments. Uh, th this was a, a thoroughly uh, money-making, uh, practically oriented, secular society. Mm -hmm. Oh, there were churches and people nominally were Christian. Mm -hmm. Church-going attendance, maybe 10 to 15 percent of the population, mm -hmm. well into the 19th century. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ironies of the location of Jamestown, where it all begins in 1607, a very short distance away is where it all ends in 1781, Yorktown. <laughs> in yes. fact, Yorktown is part of that's called the Colonial National Historic Site. Right. That's, do you find that interesting as a historian? That yeah. it, it, it's, what a coincidence that it starts and ends there in that same uh, place. Uh, it, 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 it is interesting, I suppose. Yes, six, uh, Jamestown is the site of this first permanent English settlement. Uh, a little more than a strong, stone's throw away, but not much, is Yorktown where the last important battle of the uh, War of Independence occurred. And there a, a large British army was defeated by George Washington and it should be added 
uh, an even larger French army and French navy. Uh, and it brought the war of, a war of independence basically for all practical purposes to an end and assured American independence. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting that the, the leader of the American army, of course, was an aristocrat uh, uh, who had his plantation not, uh, a little, uh, not too far away on the, on the Potomac River mm -hmm. and who was determined with the other officers to establish an aristocratic uh, nation dominated by wealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you're going there this summer. Have, yes. Haven't been since the Eisenhower era. That's right. I have probably I, well, won't give away my age, but I was a teenager <laughs> when I was there in 1953, and I'll get to get to view it now through adult eyes and, and, and take a look at the reconstruct not the reconstruction, but the uh, archaeological excavations that are underway. And they have actually the last time we were there, part of the palisaded fort has been rebuilt, and I think the ar archaeology has determined that maybe the fort wasn't where they thought it was. Yeah that maybe Jamestown Island, as it was called, with part of it is eroded and, and, and uh, yeah. fallen into the, to the James yeah. River. But there must be a warning about the rebuilding of these forts because, quite frankly, no one knows what the fort looked like. Right. There are also th three, three ships. They are replicas of, of the ships mm -hmm. that brought these first settlers to Jamestown in 1607. But then, very much like the Mayflower, that very famous ship, no one knows exactly what those ships looked like. But the one thing we know is how small they, they were. They were small. Yes. To have come across the Atlantic Ocean, the storm-tossed Atlantic Ocean in these three little tubs is an amazing thing. And of course here in, in Paducah from time to time, the, uh, a replica of the Nina, one of Columbus's ships came in. And if you right. saw that thing. Powered with a diesel engine, I do well, believe. Well, that's yeah. true, but yeah. <laughs> there's some concessions to the 20th, 21st century. But what strikes me is how incredibly small those ships were, and that is a mean ocean. That is a very rough ocean. Yeah, and it, 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 uh, it is not surprising that so many people died on the passage across the ocean. And the ships broke up in storms. They the just ship, simply they broke smashed. up in storms. They were, they were not weatherproof. Uh, they were unheated. Uh, you, were, you were basically at the mercy of the elements. Not a carnival cruise. No, not a carnival cruise <laughs> at all. <laughs> we're out of time. Thank you for coming back. We You're enjoyed welcome. this. Uh, my guest today was Dr. Dave Krieger, former professor of history here at the college. I'm Barry Craig. We will see you next time. Thank you.